We're uh, about to start the penultimate session for the day. So, uh, as we discussed before, uh, there will be the, this is the plenary where each of the groups, uh, group leaders, will be presenting back to this distinguished panel. And uh, yeah, in terms of both uh, the session one where we discuss the grand challenges and the session two where we talked about the partnering strategies for mega impact. And there will be interactions once each group leader presents to the panel. There will be interaction between the panel and the group leader. And then there will be Q&A between the audience and the group leader. And this will have it uh, for the four groups. And uh, that will uh, be the plenary session. So first I'd like to invite Ramji Raghavan uh, to begin.
they should be incorporated in the whole planning process, right? Even even maybe in the planning commission. Yeah. So as a uh, uh, we, we, the one common thread that came out of the discussion was that <coughs> NGOs had uh, a vital role in filling areas where government, uh, there was a government failure or where there was a market failure. So in areas where there was a government failure, it was, uh, it was very necessary for the NGOs we felt to go through the policy documents of the government, the intentions of the government. Very often, uh, we'll have a lot of zeal in certain areas, but uh, the government may show scant interest, least interest in such areas. So, in such areas, it's very difficult to expect uh, government support. So, uh, we felt uh, from the government side that maybe a greater awareness of policy uh, notes and policy issues, both at the centre and the state level, uh, will go a long way. Yeah. Uh, one, uh, the, it was discussed whether uh, the approach for the NGO uh, has to be from the top, this is the top to the bottom, or to demonstrate something on the field and let the government notice by itself. Uh, so a lot of debate on this uh, uh, dichotomy. Should the NGO bring forward its proposal and go and meet the highest eclairs of the government, or demonstrate and let the capillary effect uh, reach up to the powers that be? Uh, it was uh, on a number of examples were discussed. And it was felt that the capital reaction was the most trust evoking uh, kind of uh, uh, phenomenon. If, if, if an NGO is actively in the field, <coughs> it has demonstrated a number of successful projects, uh, there is greater uh, chance of greater trust being associated with that particular social entrepreneur of the NGO. Another thing that came up you know, during a group discussion was that, ND, that NGOs should instill trust in government. Means that they should inspire trust. And the role of the NGOs was also discussed that why do we need NGOs and how do they plug in? Where, where do they fit in? Do they fit in the, where the market fails or where the government fails? So we, there are certain points which we discussed during our discussion where NGOs have a, have a role to play in our <coughs> One was One aspect we also discussed was that whatever the NGO is there, it should have the technical capability. At a lot of times we don't have the technical capability and we may have a good idea, but Ultimately, that idea has to be delivered. So we need the people who have the technical capability to fulfill and deliver what has been set up as an idea. We, uh, we had a discussion on education, which uh, that because we, in our uh, group we had certain discussions on education, which which was part of the grand challenges and what we are facing in terms of education that we don't have quality of teachers, our teaching and the our teaching and learning methods are outdated, we still are following the road system and we need to change and adapt and there is another that when will we do this and uh, another thing was that we are having a lot of NGOs in this area but will the government internalize them or is it better off that what NGOs are doing, they do it, or should the government take over those things and get into it? So we had a lot of debate and on this issue and ultimately there was a consensus that what NGOs are doing, they should do what they are best at and there are certain sectors in which government should not be there, it should not be there. And especially with the discussion on innovation, should innovation be part of the government or not. So we, what we thought after discussion was that the moment innovation is made part of the government system, probably it won't be innovation anymore. So it has to be outside. So in that terms, we talked of various structures in government where this innovation can be encouraged. So 
what was the special purpose cycles, uh, then we can have PCPs, and then we can have incubation uh, projects where government has some uh, capital in it and where the entrepreneur also has a capital so that there's an interest by both of the parties and so there's a co-ownership type of a thing and which can really lead to success of a social project. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Well, I, this is very heartwarming. You know, heartwarming to see the that the dialogue has actually started. And uh, so, the as I was listening to you, I think uh, the next step to do is a lot of these dialogues would be a lot more meaningful if there's actually engagement. So, so Sanjay, I think uh, what we need to do is to take this to the next step where we do these, these kind of sessions with the IS officers who are actually engaged with the social entrepreneurs in whether it's the state or central or whatever so that people can actually talk about specifics in terms of how do you build the trust, how do you actually, uh, you know, then, then I think it becomes a little bit more uh, action oriented as opposed to theoretical. But this is very heartwarming. I'm sure all the social entrepreneurs here, let, let's give all these people a big hand. Because I think it's very, very motivating for social entrepreneurs to hear from the IS officers that uh, that they really want to see this innovation happen. So. Another thing I would like to add is, another thing I would like to add is that uh, during the discussion we came up that today we don't have a platform where say I am a social innovator, I have certain ideas, but how do I incubate it? How do I bring it? Say I need to search for an accelerator who can really jump start my project. We don't have that kind of platform. We are form having like this one forum is can be sent to a platform in that direction. But we need more such platforms. We need say I want to find out that who can help me in this, how to go about this. I I may be a, I have a good idea. But if I say want to implement it, how do I go about it? Who will help me? So this is one thing which we do need. That is why we need certain platforms or certain uh, directories or something like that where this can, where I can get some ideas and help. We have a number of uh, uh, projects for uh, poverty alleviation as well as for livelihood uh, creation. I mean, if we can uh, uh, give greater incentive to people coming up with such projects. Maybe combine livelihood creation with author, uh, drive to create entrepreneurs. Because we don't want the same NGOs to keep coming back again and again. Or the same, same social entrepreneurs coming back again and again. We need a new crop coming up every year. So this is something we talk, talked about and uh, felt it should be part of the livelihood creation project itself. Uh, I just add from the social innovation side, not that you're not innovating, but uh, in the language we're using. I personally found it really high value because I would ask them pointed questions like, tell me how the, dis the decision-making uh, process works in government. Supposing I was the secretary or chief secretary and I told you, you must do this, would it happen? And uh, they, they took us through how it actually works. And that was a lot of value added what are their perceptions of NGOs, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So uh, it was very high value added, things that I can take back with me, aside from the fact that now we have a network of some very young, up and coming IAS people, that uh, hopefully we can keep those relationships going over the years and make some good things happen. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I can provide that platform for you, so from the SIP side of taking these initiatives forward on one condition that it will be applicable for a public system, number one. Number two, it should enhance service delivery. Number three, it should also result in some kind of a cost reduction. If you are able to, if the NGOs are able to do this, we can certainly host it and take it to different states, right to the secretaries of the states, number one. Number two, some kind of a formal request has already been made to me in a meeting in Delhi with the Secretary of Health where 
the health department and also the department of administrative reforms wanted the definition and the characteristics to be defined of what is a not-for-profit organization in the health sector. They wanted us to do studies and define because this is a major problem in procurement. For instance, Arvind Eye Care, which manufactures intraocular lenses and exports to 131 countries, also has to compete with others who may or may not be indulging in the best of practices. So this is an issue. What is a not-for-profit organization? What is a charitable organization? So I'm still to get into the documentation on that, but I would soon do that. Then the issue of procurement. Then when we have a brilliant doctor from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences who left his job, settled down near Ganyari in Bilaspur, started working in low-cost technologies. Again, when it is scaling up, of his own low-cost technologies as also the diagnostic methods, this is an issue. Procurement of, issue, procurement of medicine, procurement of uh, uh, diagnostic equipment, which is maybe one-third or one-fourth of the cost of the original equipment. So we need to find ways of, of identifying those who are working in the rural areas who are not necessarily profit organizations, but who are entrepreneurs and who have the effect of reducing the cost. So I think we can certainly work on that and if there is any not-for-profit organization which, has, which wants to do any documentation, we can come in very strongly, help them out in bringing out the document and take it up with different state governments. Uh, thank you so much. One thought that I'm getting at this point in time is that the role of the private sector alongside the government, the NGOs, and uh, all of you know that CSR uh, funding, you know, it's not mandatory in that sense, but it will disclose that what have you done and give it for. Uh, as a lawyer, we do a lot of fund formation work, and uh, we already begin to set up our funds for social venture funds. The the problem is whether it qualifies under Companies Act itself is a question because Companies Act defines social, uh, uh, corporate social responsibility CSR. There are about 10, 12 items. One item is social business projects. We should expand the definition to say social uh, uh, venture. The project should include that because there is ambiguity. And just to give you uh, the scale, we just worked on some funds, almost 25,000 crores are likely to come from this initiative of the government. You can imagine the amount that would be available in this particular, not that everything will be only a business, social businesses, but there will be significant amount that would be available. If we can expand this, or clarify, what do you mean by social business project? Is an ambiguous term. If you can at least say including social venture funds, that would be of great help. And, uh, you know, a uh, lot of these problems about fundings and other things would be uh, to some extent solved. And also, they would become complementary to the community around. I think this is one point I would make at this point in time. If so, I do not know. If make a lot of it, I think that would be one thing. Uh, uh, other thing, okay, like I have to leave for my flight uh, in about six thirty or so. Uh, I hope that's all very useful. Um, two or three ideas I have played around, and maybe some point in time we can discuss. One is, see, as a international lawyer, most of the time we keep on doing mergers and acquisitions and stuff like that. Dr. Mahmoud is a close friend of mine, and he tells whenever you are in a business, you can look at the other side, in the social side, in X one the same concept. Now, can we think of mergers or acquisitions in the NGO sector? Principles are same. It will start with cultural issues. It will start with legal issues. It will have tax issues. It will have all kind of things. So scaling up, you know, would become very, you know, at least possible. If you look at every town and village, has a lot of assets locked up in NGOs. 
you look at every town would have some clinic, a school, they may, it may not have blackboard or whiteboard or whatever you call it. It would have some facility. It's a land that is sitting there. The building is run down. Okay, so some NGOs have infrastructure. Some NGOs have only money because everybody who dies, he puts some lakhs of rupees nowadays in uh, the mother, what you call it, right? Uh, children will put that money in a bank account and go and do that business. A lot of money is locked up in that. You know, if you can just pay, find a way to find out where that money is, it will also come in the system. Because they are not worried about, you know, doing anything. So, some have infrastructure, some have money. Some NGOs are very passionate people. They have no infrastructure and there is no money. Okay. So, there is the third category. Fourth is a category where they have everything, but they do not have management skills. Okay. So, if we can look at consolidation in the NGO sector, perhaps a lot of uh, synergy would come about and the fragmented approach that we have today, maybe to some extent, you know, be resolved. That was the uh, second point. Third point, uh, you know, it, many NGOs can be converted into social businesses and all of us know that social business is one. It's run like a business. But CEO's performance is not uh, considered uh, on the basis of a uh, bottom line. So it's multiple bottom line, correct? So that's how everybody understands that. Now, we should create a separate track for listing. Dr. Mohammed Yunus and Dr. Sikha Pralad, I think both had their own way of thinking. Dr. Mohammed Yunus said, you put money but don't take out, you take out original capital but don't take out dividend. <laughs> we don't even need to take out money if you list a company. So we need to have a separate, I have already talked to the city chairman about this, is that you can have a separate listing of uh, so what you call social stock exchange. I think we need to work around that as well because then it will provide liquidity. And uh, as we know, that social businesses could also be profitable. I am not suggesting profit motive or that element I am trying to insert at this point in time. But if I have a lot of money today and if I put money, Tomorrow I run out or something happens, bankruptcy happens, or I want to exit. The exchange will allow me to do that. If I make more money, then I will put in other social venture. Because that is giving good return, like microfinance. Of course, it's gone on to different tangent as well, all of us know in some ways. So because the, 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 the greed, greed can also take over. I'm uh, aware of that factor. I'm not suggesting for a moment. But social business would be extremely helpful to focus on so that people, instead of just Focus on the profit, they will focus on social objectives, and at the same time, it will become part of the ecosystem of the whole uh, uh, country. So, I think one thought we should, I think, explore more is about social stock exchange, social business stock exchange. These are some of the initial thoughts, uh, uh, you know, I could, I can detail uh, out later on, but this comes to my mind right away. Thank you very much. Uh, quick time check here, it's uh, five minutes past six. Uh, we need to wrap up this session. Uh, Sam is waiting for us by 6.30, so it was 25 minutes. So the remaining three groups got uh, five minutes of presentation, but five minutes of Q&A, that'd be helpful. Uh, the group number three, J.S. Singh, and uh, our team. We started out all over the map. We all know what the problems are, sanitation, education, healthcare. But the first overarching theme that came up was effective governance. There was a lot of bashing about accountability and audits and monitoring, um, you know, carrot and stick approach to governance. But then as we drilled down deeper, we came up with issues of capacity building, what it means, does it start at the family and the community level, or does it go top down from the institution level? We talked about HR uh, and training needs. We talked about access to capital and government tenders and how they're floated and whether that's conducive to smaller organizations being competitive in those things. A lot of these issues um, were discussed over and over, but the biggest theme that emerged from our group really was about mindset change, behavior modification. And th this particular theme, I tried to steer the discussion, well, we need a one or two year uh, long program to address the challenge, can you really tackle mindset and behavior modification in that span of time. But the entire group really converged on this one idea, that unless we start changing our mindset, uh, foster a culture of creativity, it's impossible to achieve 
change in the long term overall to address our problems. So I think um, I'll stop that with that theme and hand it over uh, to the rest of my group. Uh, good evening, friends. By uh, our group mentioned, uh, discussed about three things only. Uh, this is regarding mindset, effective governance, and capacity building. Uh, I have seen during my tenure as deputy commissioner uh, in Haryana, uh, most of the district they have put in infrastructure. The problem is about availability, accessibility, and credibility. You have school but don't have doctor. Doctors don't go there. You have, you have schools, you don't, teachers don't go, you have uh, hospitals, doctors don't go there. So I started my new concept of night camping during my tenure. So we used to go in the morning at 9 o'clock, uh, all the HODs, and uh, ensure all the necessary services uh, like health camp, medical camp, veterinary camp, <coughs> Aadhaar card, ration card, and uh, driving licenses on the spot, birth and uh, death certificates are in one issue there. At, nine, at 4 o'clock, all the HODs, including me, we used to go in the village. So I found that, uh, and in the evening session, we used to discuss only social issues. There used to be Gram Sabha meeting. Uh, all the issues like female feticide, Parda Pratha, um, my district used to have six blocks. Uh, one adjoining with Patiala in Punjab, and two with uh, district uh, with uh, this Karnal and Kurukshetra, and one this Zind area, uh, uh, comparatively backward area. And there was Parda system, and uh, there was need for women empowerment, uh, theft of electricity and water. So, in the evening session. We used to discuss about all these, uh, the, the problem is, uh, I found, uh, effective governance was required. Uh, PRIs uh, used to cooperate us. We used to invite some punches and videos on all the HODs. So, in our discussion, uh, all our group, we found that there is need of effective governance. Our presence should be there. Otherwise, there is no, no point in uh, policy our presence should be there. I used to discuss all the social issues with um, um, the people till late, late night and 12 o'clock. Please, you want to add something? I think it's quite fashionable to criticize government. Government is not doing this thing, government is not doing that thing. But what is society? It evolves from the family. If we cannot run our family efficiently, if we cannot run our model efficiently, so bottom line is all the stakeholders need to devote to the cause. It cannot be one with traffic government a sort of schemes. But uh, should, uh, like uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar has rightly pointed out, government has scheme. But if the woman is not allowed to go to the state because she has to be a reporter, so the initiative has to come from me as an individual, from my family, from wherever I am working, from my organization, wherever I live, from that or wherever uh, with society community are from our education institution, from our religious institution. I think it's a wonderful platform given to us. It is a very thought provo provoking for all of us. Rather than indulging in blaming game, rather than having expectation from the other party, I think we need, we need to devote our best and I think other party will automatically give their best. Thank you. Overall, you know, well, just one suggestion for you, uh, Sanjay. Uh, every time we have social entrepreneurs, we always think about mentors as people from the industry, from the society, and so on. I think we have so many well-meaning senior IS officers that AFI can play a role now of actually getting them up with social entrepreneurs, so just like Ramji was saying, uh, he finds it extremely valuable just to see how they think and how they navigate so that we break the fall, so that the IAS officers can be mentors okay. to a lot of the social entrepreneurs that we have in the network now. So, sure. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I can invite Amit Jain's group. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, it has been a wonderful day at AFI today. 
and we had group one as uh, participants range from social entrepreneurs and I must say that we had a heavy battery of social entrepreneurs in our group. Four of them of which three presented today morning. So it was quite a task for me to kind of navigate and keep calm between the entrepreneurs and the IAS group. Uh, also, uh, there were some, some ground rules that we created at the start and I would very quickly tell those. Uh, one is that we insisted that we will have only action words being used during the discussion. And there should be clear output and process orientation. And those meant very much for us throughout the discussion. Then we also incidentally had a representation from Northeast, West and South of India, all four. And we also had representation from IAS group, which ranged from sub-collector to a secretary in a Northeastern state. So quite a kind of a variety. Then we also uh, had pretty healthy debate uh, without entering it, without for me having a need to kind of pacify or, you know, just raise hand to kind of ask them to kind of quiet down. It was a healthy debate. Uh, we also had a state representation from Maharashtra, which is showing some bigger innovations, which Divya will talk more in detail. And we also very openly talked about the rating part, screening part, accreditation part of uh, NGOs and social entrepreneurs. And we also dwelled upon whether the social entrepreneurs in real sense are reaching out and meeting the need of the people, or is it only the greed of social entrepreneur, which is becoming you know more common, because they are always oriented more towards exits and IPOs and things like that. And Mr. Desai, we also talked about the social impact exchange, which you just mentioned about the sto social stock exchange. Uh, we have had an excellent uh, person in form of Divya, which noted out everything to the T and then kept uh, us all aligned towards the output areas. And now she'll take over to discuss about the major challenges that we identified and the solution areas for those. Thank you, Mr. Jain. Uh, so, we as a group thought that since it's a forum for both the government and the social innovators to interact, uh, we shouldn't only talk about problems of the government separately or of the social innovators separately. So, we discussed areas where both are coming together and how we solve the issues where there is interaction between the two. So, I just quickly list down the two problems, main problems which the social innovators face. For instance, where is a forum that exists for social innovators to interact with policy makers? For instance, one of uh, the social innovators in our group had some problem with TRI guidelines. So how does he interact with the people who are making the policies at a higher level? So uh, Mr. Jain had come out with an idea that why don't we have a body, something like uh, FICI or CII or NASCOM or AS ASOCHAM to you know address such issues why don't social innovators have such a group so that they will be constantly interacting with the policy makers to help them make better policies for social innovators. Uh, so this is one big idea which came up. And other issue which the social innovators are facing, I have a brilliant idea. I want to uh, uh, scale it up for mega impact, but how do I take it to the different stakeholders and to the government uh, and uh, tell that my idea is workable? So this was another big problem. Uh, and combined with it, from the government side, was one major issue that we didn't have flexibility at the lower levels to incorporate innovation in our uh, smaller sector or level. For instance, if a district collector uh, has some flexibility in terms of having a fund, then he can uh, select some small innovation which is working very well in his sector, which is addressing the local need, and he can scale it up. So two, three issues came up, like in Maharashtra they have this uh, uh, fund which is called uh, the Navapurna Yojana. I don't think I'm pronouncing it right, but it means something like an innovation fund where a part of the district budget, will, that is 2% of it, is allocated for the innovation and the district collector can choose to uh, decide where it can be expended on. And uh, another issue from the San Petroda team came up that there is a district innovation fund which is lying there and not being used. So it's high time that we uh, uh, use it to select the entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, and uh, use it to the uh, uh, good effect. And finally, the other issue which many groups also flagged is that, okay, we have some flexibility and funds with us, but how do we select the right kind of social innovator? 
because uh, there's always this issue with the government that's always skeptical about the social innovators mm -hmm. like are the NGOs doing money laundering are they really uh, telling the kind of impact which they have made is it real or not so these kind of issues are there so how do we address those issues and uh, help the government pick the right social innovator to scale up for mega impact so it should it be an accreditation is if it is an accreditation then we all felt very strongly that it should not be by the government because some of the participants felt that if it is by the government then it will be one more step of bribing and you need to get that accreditation in place uh, so instead it should be some third party organization which does the accreditation so that uh, as a uh, government official i shouldn't be bothered about uh, uh, issues like whether the, they are having a clean source of funding um, for which they uh, used and tapped and to make that innovation uh, is the right kind of uh, impact they are mentioning, is it true or not. So those kind of uh, mundane things should be taken care of by the accredit accreditation so that I gen direct directly go and pick their project and uh, scale it. So these are the, uh, some ideas which we came up. Thank you so much. <coughs> AFI is your NASCO component. Now, now, how many of the social entrepreneurs and the government people would pay a fee to become a part of AFI? <coughs> What's that? <laughs> right, right. No, no, no. Because poor Sanjay is trying to figure out a financial model to run this organization. And I think at some point we have to either believe that there's value in it or there's no value in it. Right? And if there is a value in it, then everybody has to chip in so that uh, poor Sanjay can actually run this organization. So I think I would, instead of creating another organization, I would suggest that you may want to think about AFI as your advocacy as sort of the, uh, the, the organization equal to NASCOM because he's already been working on it for a couple of years and it's got a certain amount of momentum to it. So. That's an excellent idea. Uh, good morning. Uh, I just uh, brief about uh, the key problems which we discussed and before uh, we actually come up with the one particular solution for one particular problem. So uh, we have discussed problems ranging from education, solar and uh, health and all this. Uh, from education perspective, uh, one of the uh, discussion points was uh, in the current uh, flexi grant scheme, I think innovator is losing benefit because once uh, threshold level is reached, in particular amount is reached, I think uh, they are knocking off the innovators and uh, they are going beyond it. And central government is not approving for that. I think uh, that is something which can be looked at at a uh, grand level, at India level. Uh, in terms of RT, current RTI policy, non-formal education is not being considered and it is completely uh, not considering as part of the current system because of uh, some issues. So uh, one of the uh, entrepreneur is actually uh, working in this particular area, he's actually working in the next area. So uh, he's actually giving a be better service, so this can also be looked at from the government side, so that the service can be actually streamlined. Uh, in terms of uh, power and uh, solar, uh, we have uh, discussed about uh, uh, issues ranging from a communication. There should be some policy between social entrepreneurs and uh, uh, government side. And uh, we also require some kind of a policy in terms of a subsidy given for the solar side. 30% subsidy is still not regularized, streamlined. streamlined. So this is something that can be looked at a national level. Uh, in terms of uh, large scale mission projects, uh, we have uh, discussed in a length. Uh, uh, one thing came out in all the discussions is there is no process or there is no streamlined process, there is no standardized process and structure uh, in running this kind of a mission. And uh, most of these e governance projects today in India are run by uh, contractors and staff. Once the uh, attrition is a huge issue in the contractor staff, once they come up and lose, uh, lose that uh, knowledge, I think it is lost. So this is something the government can look upon and uh, can bring some kind of a process oriented rather than individualized uh, process. Also, we discussed about some problems with respect to scaling up. There is no uh, model, replication model to duplicate some of these big uh, uh, models. So that is something uh, can be looked at. And uh, every entrepreneur, uh, not just looking at his solution, he should also add uh, a social change as a key component in his uh, uh, venture. 
So that uh, that also solves some of these uh, bigger issues, uh, peripheral issues which are creeping up. And uh, another discussion point which came out is there is no holistic approach in terms of scaling up. Since we have stories, very good stories, that can also be uh, taken into that. Uh, from the government side, uh, we have discussed a couple of uh, problems. Uh, in the, uh, again, this is already discussed, a uh, predecessor successor problem. I think somebody initiates, uh, somebody dismantles. So this can be processized. So it should not be like an individual centric, it should be an institution centric. So that can be looked upon. And uh, uh, from the innovator side, I think the government has suggested that application should be simple so that uh, uh, this can be uh, taken into the well into the contest, uh, in Indian contest, frugal contest, so that the government also can take it to, to the scale. Do you have any other comments? Good evening, everybody, and I think much is already said. The uh, idea of uh, yet another thing is to have a product innovation challenge fund, which is part of the uh, the government shows, uh, think about these, and service improvement challenge fund. Both of these are very, very essential part because one takes care of the product designs, which would be in fact most cost and com cost effective as well as co you know um, uh, applicable to the, uh, the given uh, scenario that is there in the field. And secondly, the service improvement. There are various ways. Government would have one straight jacketed approach, but I'm sure there are different ways of looking at the same service delivery, how to better this. So these two funds would certainly help any innovator uh, come across to with his innovation in service as well as product design. The second one which I we had inter, in fact discussed is on setting up a sort of a uh, uh, handholding because government speaks a different language altogether and uh, a social innovator I'm sure <laughs> our friend here rightly mentioned because it needs a different sort of metal and different sort of deciphering the entire language that the government speaks and sure there's a greater challenge for the innovator to get to across. Possibly you could have some sort of a working group within the department or within sectors which will certainly vet these proposals and do the devil's advocate's role and then we in fact can get across the real you know, brass tacks of that and whether it works or doesn't work. Sometimes you might feel it is because uh, you know uh, it is your baby and you feel always it is very nice and I'm sure when it is put to the acid test then it will, you will find this. The third one is in fact to have some sort of like, like in the Oxford area you have a bio Wednesday, that's where all the biotech innovations are discussed uh, along with all uh, stakeholders and if that sort of a stakeholder meetings are frequently held it would be more uh, useful for people to in fact uh, translate it into real uh, 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 you know real successes uh, whatsoever it might be and you know you will not waste time in uh, running from pillar to post or you know running across you know so this will certainly give you a sort of uh, one is confidence level and thirdly in fact we were suggesting that there should be all departments with such activities should record newsletters so that all these discussions are minuted and then you get across that there is a continuum of idea so that it doesn't become person centric but it becomes an institution centric and, uh, thank you yeah uh, just to add uh, this is the hypothetical situation we have actually thought of the situation is like this social innovator has tested his solution already it is vetted how does the government buy this idea and scale this idea? This is the discussion and uh, some of the points which we uh, are adding to what uh, uh, is been told. One point has come out is to bring the neutrality of the situation. So research paper by an institution. So that can be actually brought in so that students and professors can also vet this solution. So it brings uh, some handholding for the government. And second point is the single window system uh, policy covering the time frames also has to be there. The third point is multidisciplinary committee has to be formed so that this can be discussed at a very uh, different level. Fourth point is uh, uh, so, uh, uh, separate sector specific and problem specific innovation fund has to be chopped out. It is already been discussed. And uh, another point is a spe sector specific call center has to be there. Suppose if it is an agriculture problem, all the agriculture problems should be resolved through this particular call center. And uh, another uh, uh, thing which we have already discussed uh, here is institutionalizing and calendarizing this entire uh, uh, mentoring cleanups so that that can be uh, worked out. Uh, the last one is uh, social innovators also require some kind of support from the government official, if I already told in the question answers, so that they can actually do the leveraging and networking behalf of uh, this one. So they will be kind of part of uh, advisory board. So these are the, some of the solution specific elements and process specific elements for this particular problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. A minute each for the panelists so that we close this session. Starting with you, Vish. Oh, okay. No, I think this is very enlightening. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we do at MIT uh, after we start the center was that a lot of the reviews and inputs were primarily faculty giving input to other faculty and graduate students and postdocs. 
And, and what we do now, after we set up the center, is that we have equal number of outsiders, practitioners, and the faculty giving input. So somehow having review groups of leading social entrepreneurs and leading government officers, reviewing projects, and, and giving feedback to social entrepreneurs, I think would be very, very powerful. I think I picked up the two points uh, which you just made last time, that uh, there is a uh, little non-recognition of informal education. I think that's the largest source of employment creation possibly. If you see Indian Idol, every time I see, I feel how much talent exists. Now, one thing is for them to go on the TV shows and other, but after they go back and 90% lose, one person wins, right? What are we doing with those people? That was one thing. And second thing that, uh, you know, idea exchanges which uh, was talked about. You share experience and create some kind of system, so mindset of innovation comes up and we, what, what is needed to be done is instead of brainstorming, uh, you call now brain steering. So you give some direction to your discussion, uh, that is, I think government can do a good job because they are very well organized in those thought process and then leave it to the people to discuss their stories or whatever they want to be. So I think it's some kind of a, uh, saying maybe is uh, done so that you know when governmental official is there, people would tend to come and attend, and you know that will itself create some kind of fear yeah, and tell everybody that how do you solve this problem. So each one can be given. Uh, there are many other ways once you get the right critical mass. Uh, so. Well, I think it was uh, very well said. Uh, one very interesting listening to the different uh, groups and the views that came out. And clearly, uh, there are two or three things which, uh, which came out. One is that uh, we, the first group, for instance, had mentioned that uh, you know the view was that the social entrepreneurs uh, could work in the areas which uh, they are best at, and the government could work in those areas where they are best at. Uh, well, that's, that, that's fine, that kind of a consensus. Uh, but when we are solid, trying to solve a national uh, problem or we are trying to look at a particularly uh, pressing problem, uh, as long as there is an agreed game plan, even if it segments uh, the solution space into this, uh, I think it's, it's fine. But some work is still required to actually sit down and in a specific contest uh, figure out what is best done by the social entrepreneurs and what is best done by the government and how does the sum of the two become better then each one just uh, it individually. The second is uh, that uh, the social entrepreneurs who are creating a model which works efficiently and which is also financially viable would be in one category where they are creating a certain value but they need some help in scaling it up. Partly because of the managerial uh, bandwidth or maybe because of some other reasons but not because of the lack of viability. And the second is where there are you know, uh, civil society organizations, which have created a better model, which is still not viable, but which perhaps requires less of government support, where inevitably the involvement of the government comes in. And in such cases, there may be little option but for the government and the uh, social entrepreneurs to actually work together, which again requires a model to be, to be evolved. So I think in each of these uh, cases, perhaps, uh, kind of an evolution uh, would be would be required and perhaps uh, at the end of events uh, like this if there are uh, groupings which emerge and say okay let's now figure out the next level of detail and go back and work on it I think that would be a huge uh, contribution. Thank you. Yeah, uh, all that I would like to say is that uh, I would like this kind of interactions these kinds of interactions to be institutionalized. And the best manner in which it can be done is through the ATIs, Administrative Training Institutions in different parts of the country. And I would certainly write to them saying that whenever they do the capacity building programs in different sectors, and if they think that the inputs from the social innovators are relevant, they may also be invited. And then I have already been suggesting that I did it as an additional DG of the Marichanarani Institute in Hyderabad. About three years back, we had conducted programs on the right education the issue that came up. Inclusion of non-formal education in the right education, we will certainly do that. And I will write to the chief secretaries and also the DGs of the ATI.
to bring in the social innovators on board whenever we do programs from above, they do programs for their own officers for the capacity building. The second thing is on the DIF, District Innovation Fund, each district collector has been given one crore by the 13th Finance Commission for innovative practices. The collector is, is competent to sanction any project within that. In any sector of his choice, it could be for um, major interventions, it could be for process, it could process changes, it could be for governance reforms, etc. So my suggestion is if you have any project and if you think that it's worth implementing in any particular district, the district collector would still have the resources. I know from personal knowledge that not much of that has been utilized and they have been utilized for small little last mile interventions which is not what it is. It's called the District Innovation Fund. So those of you who are in need of small little resources at the district level, this is one source that if there is any anything that we could do from the Center for Innovations, we will certainly write to the collectors and to the concerned secretaries of the states. This is all that I want to. This has been a wonderful opportunity listening to all of you. We would certainly take these suggestions on board in all the programs that we do, we do a lot of workshops in different states with the ATIs, with the not-for-profit organizations. We'll certainly take them Can I just... Lawyers like to... Sorry. No, lawyers like to last word. So, uh, I would like to ask one question. Everywhere there is a problem. Can we create some kind of inventory? One set of problems will be identified by the people within the locality. But there will be another set of people who look at from external perspective and find out. Is there some website or something that these are the problems? Because you identify problems, that may give us mindset, okay, here is a problem. Okay, malnutrition is there or water or whatever you want to put it. So if some people want to focus on innovation, there is some direction to that. Some will be intuitional. But some, they can say, oh, this is a problem constantly everyone is facing, do you understand? So I do not know if, you know, there is some way to have inventory. I know thousands of different things will come up, but if with that data mining, you can uh, give direction to the people who want to innovate. Uh, actually, uh, Desh was mentioning about this. In the US, there's something called the National Academy of Engineering, and they have listed about 14 grand challenges that are facing the US in different disciplines. So they in fact recommended that Action for India take a step in terms of identifying what those problems are so that the uh, energy and attention of the group of the social innovation community, the government can be directed to those problems. So we will play a role in both the Deshpande Foundation and other organizations to be able to create that inventory that is Once again, thank you.